This time on Poll Hub, you'd think with all that's happened since the confirmation battle over Brett Kavanaugh, there'd be some real movement in the national polls with regards to the president and control of Congress. And there has been, but our brand new poll isn't like what you've been hearing elsewhere. Details ahead. We're also digging into two new state polls that we've done with NBC News, Georgia and Mississippi, and then early voting. There's been plenty of reports about how the first few days of early voting seem to be favoring Republicans. Is it? How much credence should we give that info? Well, our guest has some thoughts on that. Let's get started. And hi, everybody. This is Paul Hub. I'm J.D. Dapper, Director of Innovation here at the Marist Poll. And I'm Barbara Carvalho, Director of the Marist Poll. And I'm Lee Marengoff, Director of the Marist College Institute for Public Opinion at Poughkeepsie, New York. That's, College. And, and that's where we're at. That's where we are. Yeah. Hey, um... We've done a lot of national polls for a long time. One of the things we've talked about over and over is how President Trump's approval rating, which so many people watch, this is like the barometer, right, that everybody follows, hasn't changed very much over the 18, 19, 20, 24 months. Whatever it is that we've been polling that, it really hasn't moved very much. But since the Brett Kavanaugh hearings, there's been a kind of a, a media narrative that that really energized Republicans, made them more likely to come out and vote, and more importantly, started boosting Donald Trump's approval rating, narrowing the generic uh, congressional ballot, all that stuff. Uh, We've just completed a national poll with NPR and PBS NewsHour, and we're not seeing exactly that narrative. Yeah, well, we did, I mean, we did see a little bit during the the hearings. We saw how um, people got very polarized again, and both sides energized, and we and we saw an, uh, at the beginning of October, we did see a narrowing of the generic congressional ballot question, which is your you know straight Democrat Republican. Uh, we saw greater enthusiasm among Republicans because they were behind and had more room to catch up in a sense. And also, there's there's a there is something to be said for moving from you know September 30th to October 1st when you have a when you have a November election mm-hmm. uh, people start people start to focus and so that that increase um, in enthusiasm and interest uh, is partly because of the the time of year but this time uh, but since that time, a number of polls have come out showing that the president had been gaining um, in support and people being uh, more supportive or approving of his of the job that he's uh, doing as president. And our latest poll with NPR and the PBS NewsHour has still shown a pretty much a steady state in the midst of, of Kavanaugh. We had the president's approval rating at 41 percent right now. We have it at 39%. So it's still statistically in that high same, 30s, same low 40s place that we have seen over time. And the point that you make, Jay, that we haven't seen um, a lot of difference. I think one thing, though, that is very interesting as we're getting closer to Election Day is how much Trump is really on the minds of mm-hmm. voters as they're thinking about who they're going to vote for Congress, who they're going to vote for Senate. I was really struck by those numbers because we're seeing that Donald Trump is going to be a major factor for a lot of people, more so than Barack Obama was in the last midterm. 67% yeah. of voters tell yeah. us that their opinion of Trump will be either a major or minor factor in deciding their vote for Congress. Yeah, and so, and so that is, in essence, to quote a former vice president, a big deal. And that was 47% for Obama in, yeah. in, in 2014. So, so we're, see, we're seeing that a lot. And we're also seeing that women are more likely than men. Gender gap. Enormous. Very, uh, very significant. Uh, and that's one thing uh, we know that turnout is going to be off the charts. It will also be a wide and probably historic uh, gender gap. And then we are seeing in the congressional generic ballot, generic congressional ballot, uh, we were down to six points, advantaging the Democrats. Now we're at 10 again. So some of the Kavanaugh effect was there, perhaps, and likely to have been temporary. We move on. If we've learned anything during the Trump administration, new cycles move rapidly. Yeah, it's every five minutes there's yeah. a new new yeah. cycle. Two things stood out to me here, and they're actually about the issues, health care and yeah. uh, the economy, <laughs> and then and then tax cuts, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, health care has been number one um, uh, for quite some time, and it kind of slipped to number two, close, so 19% 
think healthcare uh, economy and jobs is 20 percent. But that you would think would be favoring the president uh, because economy and jobs has traditionally been a Republican thing. But that moved in one direction towards what you'd think would be Republican. But the Trump approval rating, the congressional uh, generic congressional ballot moved the other direction. What, what's going on there, do you think? Well, we, you know, we did ask people, um, we followed up and asked, you know, does your opinion of Trump uh, make you more likely to vote for a Democrat for Congress or for a Republican? And right now, that gap is, um, so I can, let me see if I can, you know, add and subtract quickly. Uh, I should have written that down. Do, doing these gaps, you know, there's, <laughs> there's no computer within sight right now. We're a calculator. But it's, um, you know, it's a, that's a plus, that's a plus 13 um, for the Democrats. And so if we're trying to figure out, well, how does, you know, how does, Trump really, you know, shake out. Obviously, it's going to be state by state. It's going to be district by district. But these national numbers can give us a sense of just the overall movement of of what is what is happening. And the states tend to be connected in in a in a way. There, this is a national. This is a national election in the sense that the issues get nationalized, um, the chatter is nationalized, um, the discussion is nationalized, yeah. and so um, it's very difficult for a state to be a complete outlier um, yeah. on any one of yeah. these uh, uh, yeah. measures. And, and I'll say, you know, every now we do, and Jay, I'm really glad you brought up this whole side of this national poll, uh, because every now and then you find a national response in a survey that really is a a eye opener a, or a bellwether a wow moment okay yeah. so we had one in this survey so we asked this about this is when we go back and make sure the numbers are actually right yeah, absolutely <laughs> double double check uh, and so so one of the things we found we asked about what do people think about the tax cuts and what do they think about entitlement programs yeah, given so we, the need to reduce yeah, the federal so we deficit. Asked, just let me set up yeah. a question, and then you go to the results. We asked, which of the following comes closest to your view about how to reduce the federal budget deficit? One, mostly cut government spending, including entitlement programs like Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, or mostly increase revenues by reversing the tax cuts. These are the Trump tax cuts passed by Congress last year. And we, and we know from the campaign trail that Republicans aren't really pushing the tax cut. Well, the reason is, is because 60% of Americans want to reverse the tax cuts, and only 21% want to get into cutting entitlement programs, which we've heard McDonald, uh, McConnell and others uh, talking right. about. Uh, but it's more interesting So the that. public is uh, totally in a different place than our national leadership on, on the overall priority, and even people who are Trump supporters this is, this divide yeah, that, on that, was that the, question. That was the shocker for 38% me. say they'd like to reverse the, the uh, tax cuts. Th oh, no, I'm sorry. No, 36. I'm 36% and 38% say they'd like to cut entitlement a, programs. A third of Trump voters say... It's a, even, give, give it's up, even. Give up the tax cut. Yeah. And a quarter are undecided or yeah. unsure. Yeah. 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 So, so, you know, there, there, are, there are folks showing up at rallies and saying all kinds of things and chanting all kinds of things. But when it push comes to shove, public opinion is so in a different place in terms of our federal priorities uh, than what's being I mean, advanced. Isn't by part of that, right though, that you throw out cut Social Security, Medicare and Medicaid? And that's been something Democrats have understood for a generation all you've got, that's their scare tactic. Republicans say that's their scare tactic. Just say that, that Republicans are going to cut one of these three programs and you've got it. You've got to win. Is that, also, isn't that part but, of what's but, going on? But the but tax, on, the but tax cut issue was already in and of itself losing popularity independent of what to do with the True. entitlements. Well, wait a True. second. But, yeah. but on that question yeah. wording, and that's, you know, that's a, that's a fair, that's a fair comment. Mm -hmm. And what we did was we went back to see what Senator McConnell said. Mm -hmm. And so we constructed the, the, the question based on what the proposal was. And he specifically said, in fact, I think we had um, originally in the question Medicare and Medicaid because it was healthcare focused originally, and that was our perception. And we went back and checked to see what McConnell was actually saying about it. And he included Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. And that is why we put that information um, in the question, not to be a democratic question, but to actually frame it in the way that it is being discussed in Congress. Yeah. And we know from our state by state polls that there's not a lot of enthusiasm about advancing the Trump agenda. Agenda. The support of Donald Trump is not really an issue-based support 
even though Congress would like uh, the Republican side to make it that. Um, but I don't know. It's, I, a, per, well, it's, it's a, a personality. Exactly. Thing. I mean, I think yeah. it is very much think, about his, yeah. who he him. is and and what what people you know think of him. And as, he keeps making it about. It. I mean, he's saying at every one of his rallies, is, d- 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 a vote for a vote for whoever the candidate is standing off the side of the stage is a vote for Trump. He's making it about Trump. Except so, except if the Republicans lose the majority in the House, it's not his fault. Then it won't be his, his fault. So, <laughs> so, um, so let's talk about Mississippi. Yeah. M i s s i s s i p p i and uh, Georgia. You spell uh, that backwards, and I'll be. I can't do that. Okay. Well, I could if I read it, but it would take too much time. So uh, what, what did we find in these two states? Mississippi, it's like, why would we bother polling Mississippi? It's the reddest of the red states, right? Well, it, it, there's a special election, and if uh, someone... They actually have two senators yeah. up because Just like of Minnesota. the retirement yeah. of uh, Thad Cochran. Um, and uh, uh, Cindy Hyde-Smith was uh, appointed. Uh, so there's a special election uh, and, and, there for and, that and, seat. And the only thing that this really points in the direction right now is that if no one gets a clear majority of a multi-candidate field, there will be a special election. It's in that in that race. In, in that in the spe- there'll be a special elect. There'll be a follow up election because there's a two, runoff election because there's the two special. Republicans yeah. and one Democrat yeah. running. That's yeah. basically and, and, and so you know there's no great expectation that the Democrats could somehow carry Mississippi. Like they, they won did, Alabama, like they did Alabama. Door. Yeah, and and um, what it does point to is that we may conceivably not even know election night whether the Republicans or Democrats have gotten a control of the majority of the Senate. Because this one might be going into a runoff, and that will start. And that's in December. Yeah. Uh, so, no, and Mike, November. No, the end oh, of November. And, and that's Mike Espy. The, the the other reason to note is that Mike Espy was former uh, Secretary of Agriculture, uh, I believe. But, but you right. know, yeah. right, but but right now, but he's a noted. He, he's absolutely. not a no name Democrat. He's right. actually somebody who is noted and named. And he's he's right now in our poll in second place. A Republican who is Trumpier than Trump is in third place. And then um, Cindy Hyde Smith, who used to be a Democrat, but that's very typical in the South. Uh, Democrats becoming Republicans so they can win. Uh, is in the lead there, and yes. then there's Third, a really, uh, yes, she has yeah. thir- there, she has thirty eight percent. SB has twenty nine, uh, and Chris McDaniel, who you mentioned, has fifteen percent. And then there's a contest in Georgia that we just uh, polled as well, and the one there that's getting a lot of attention is the race for governor between Brian Kemp and Stacey Abrams, and that one, as they say, is too close to call. We're just going to have to see how that plays out, but it's a whole lot about discussion about voter suppression, and then there was issues about flags, and there's a whole lot going on in Georgia. It's a really intense contest. Yeah, one thing that was interesting to me about this is that when we looked at registered voters and then we looked at our Mm -hmm. likely voter screen, um, Kemp um, improves a bit with the likely voter screen, uh, the the Republican. But what, um, what we're, you know, Seeing is this incredible amount of turnout in the in the um, uh, the voting the early voting, yep. and we're going to talk about that in the next segment. I just wonder if that uh, is maybe we're seeing something in the early voting that could change the what we're seeing in the poll here. Yep, that's what we're going to be watching for election night. Well, we're certainly counting down the days to Election Day. And one of the things that uh, we'd like to do and can be informative as uh, we approach uh, Election Day itself is to take a look at the early vote. Many of the states right now uh, have early voting, not just absentee voting, but uh, actually locations where uh, people can go and vote. And, you know, that becomes part of the mix along with all of the other polling to figure out who may be ahead and who's behind. But it's not for the faint of heart. And today we are joined uh, by associate professor at the University of Florida, Michael McDonald, uh, who specializes in American elections and has something known as the election Election project, which we have followed for years. Um, how are you doing, Michael? Thanks for joining us. I am very tired because I'm <laughs> constantly entering new data. Tell us a little bit about the election project that uh, that you have been working on and, and what that's all about. Yeah, so um, back in 2000, I had published a, a, a influential paper in the American Political Science Review that calculated uh, turnout rates for the country and for some states. And I'd done this in a different way. I'd calculated it for those eligible to vote rather than the voting age population. 
and I wanted a platform to disseminate those turnout rates, so I created a website to, uh, to put those numbers out uh, for the general public because I was constantly having to update them with new elections, and it just made sense to have a nice platform to disseminate the data. In 2008, uh, uh, the exit poll organization uh, had approached me to compile information on early voting, and as a kind of a lark, I said, okay, I'll, I'll do it, and uh, I'll just post it on this website, too. And mm-hmm. um, so, you know, I'm more than a million hits later, <laughs> because everybody was interested in what was going on, and copycats from the media who were taking my data and uh, publishing it as their own, but that's fine. I, I am very transparent about all the sources of, of where I'm getting the data, so anyone could do this. It's not you know, I'm not the sole proprietor of these data. These data are election officials' data, not my data. Um, but anyway, so after a million hits, you know, I, now I track the early vote as well for every election cycle. And I, I have other data on there as well. Like I, um, I've been um, doing some work with the current population survey, uh, trying to account for their non-response and over-report bias. And I uh, have some uh, statistics on the website that take uh, those um uh, biases into account and, and attempt a at correction. And, you know, that's a whole other thing. I know that a lot of your listeners would be very fascinated about uh, the sort of uh, things that are going on with census, but uh, we're really here to talk early voting. Yeah. Um, Michael, um, your uh, your name was first put in front of us by Joe Lenski, who, of course, does the exit polls. And, you know, the exit polls are, you know, everybody's kind of like, likes to condemn them in some way or another, but they just love it. Any kernels of information, and then they're largely misinterpreted, you know, when we find out the early waves are like uh, a baseball score in the seventh inning. Um, You provide this, what I think is fascinating stuff, at a time where any kernel of information is also highly valued. But then again, some of the comparisons are being made that are not necessarily the ones you would suggest people are making between now and another time or, or currently you know, we're seeing results are showing the Republicans are ahead in the early vote with the exception of Nevada. I don't know if that's the most current, but that's something that I read, I think, yesterday. Um, What's tell going us, on? Yeah, yeah, tell us about, you know, how should yeah. we be using this stuff? Because it's like so important and you're so, as you said, transparent. So explain how we should use this. Well, before I say that, let me just say um, uh, Joe is a good friend of mine mm-hmm. um, and we are always back and forth during election season uh, talking about uh, the data. And um, uh, but, but, you know, uh, the person who uh, really turned me on to looking at the early vote uh, or really voting data on um, these turnout rates was uh, Warren Matofsky. Uh, I, so I knew you were going to say that. Uh, I knew you were going to yeah. say that, Michael. Uh, and so, you know, uh, yeah. uh, Joe so, and I very often, Warren was a dear friend of ours and, and the founder of so much of what we uh, what we all hold so dear. Um, and Joe's he comment... Was the head, he was the head of the CBS uh, uh, News York election Times, yeah. in New York Times of election year, but mostly, but he was CBS and, and then head of the um, the exit poll. Yeah, and then one, one of the services. things that Joe and I have talked about, and Joe was, of course, his protege, um, is that... Warren still teaches us, who he's been dead for quite some time, but there's still things that Warren said that about what you know the principles are and the direction you said. He's still teaching us even today. So I'm I'm very pleased. He, yeah, but I'm I'm not him. I'm not as smart as I was when Warren was alive. Yeah, he, he helped us all. <laughs> so yes, yeah, so back to uh, <laughs> the early uh, voting. Um, I really mentioned Warren because uh, you know I've done work with the exit polls for a while and I have been critical of the exit polls, but you know, to the credit, Warren and then uh, Joe have really tried to improve them. They're they're uh, they're self-reflective on their methodology. And uh, when I was first collecting the early vote data in 2008, that was really because Joe was concerned about the um, um, the effect of early voting on the exit polls, which of mm-hmm. course have transformed to a dual mode survey. And um, and so that's you know one of the reasons why we're collecting that data is so that we can have better um, estimates out of the exit polls because then we can know what the size of the early vote is and and make a pro- 
you know, appropriate adjustments on the uh, the exit polls. So, um, but that's <laughs> yeah. Moving beyond that, uh, let's talk about the early vote. Sure. And um, uh, and so. Yes, I, I've been doing this for a, a decade now of looking at these data. I've learned quite a bit myself. I mean, I've, I've also uh, been going through a learning process on how to um, understand these data. There are certain patterns that you can see in these data where um, uh, the, the conditions change over time within a state. Uh, the patterns are not the same across states. Uh, and so there's a lot of nuance to the data. And then on top of that, if that wasn't you know, difficult in and of itself, um, there's uh, um, laws are changing, uh, campaign strategies are changing, and all of these things can affect the early vote. So there's no good way, I don't think at this point at least, um, to model um, what mm -hmm. we expect with the early vote. I, I have some ways of doing it, but... Uh, there's a good amount of expert judgment that's involved in this too. And, um, uh, you know, with anything else, I try not to be biased, but, um, uh, you know, it, it's possible that I make a mistake and I'm always self-checking myself to say, what, you know, what's, what were these data telling us? So, and so that says, like, what are they telling us? <laughs> yeah. So, so NBC yeah. News, um, you know, came out with, uh, with their analysis um, of, of, the, of the early vote. Um, and as you mentioned, it, it's, it's not easy. Um, you had some issues um, with, their, with their conclusions and also their, some of their observations. Um, maybe you could share that with us. And, and first, one of my favorite tweets from you about that. High turnout, Shakes Magic 8-Ball. Signs point to yes. Who will win? Shakes Magic 8-Ball. Ask again later. Uh, one of my favorite tweets of the week. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad I could entertain, too. Um, well, uh, yes. So what was happening with that um, uh, that analysis is that... Oh, and to just, it, you know, to, to just be fair, Michael, um, you know, we, we do our polling with NBC News. Um, and so I just wanted to make sure we, we had that out there, too, because we're, we're, you know, talking about a different part of their, you know, data analytics. Well, and I have friends over at NBC, too. It's not like uh, a lot of this is poking uh, with fun. And, uh, you know, Twitter is a medium where you are um, rewarded by uh, being controversial in some ways. And so, yes, I'm being snark. I'm uh, poking fun at people. But uh, there's a lot of respect behind what I'm saying as mm -hmm. well. Um, so uh, let's um, let's look at this target smart um, uh, analysis. It, it, the thing about it was that again, I remember what I just said about there's a, a sort of a pattern of early voting, and you can um, you kind of have to understand these patterns under, to really fully understand what's going on in an election. That um, that analysis was done just at the right point in time that you'd have the best numbers for the Republicans you could possibly have um, in states like. Texas and Florida. And that's because the in-person early voting period hadn't started in those states yet. And um, so Target Smart, you know, Texas is probably the most dramatic on this, had only analyzed 100,000 absentee ballots in Texas. Well, the absentee vote tends to break very heavily towards the Republicans, um, especially in an excuse-required state like Texas. Mm -hmm. So it was natural that the Republicans would be leading the absentee mm -hmm. vote in Texas. And that was not going to be any indicator at all that there was some big red wave or, a, you know, the blue wave was fizzling or something like that. Um, and then since uh, um, that report on Monday, uh, we now have two days of data. We'll get our third um, uh, uh, in a while uh, to later today. And um, uh, <laughs> The, Texas broke its records on in-person early voting for any election, wow. uh, including a presidential election. And Texas has had in-person early voting for a long time. This is not some new phenomenon with this state. This is a state that's had a long history of having in-person early voting. So these numbers really are historic that we're seeing. We've had well over uh, 800,000 people vote in-person early in Texas in just two days, two days. Um, and so that 100,000 um, that was the original analysis um, uh, was really misleading, uh, deeply misleading. Now, uh, Florida, um, uh, we've only had 400,000 in-person early voters <laughs> in the uh, two days since we've had you know, uh, data. Um, so, or, or really three days, I guess, for Florida. But still, um, you know, it, it, again, these dynamics are changing and, and the Democrats tend to vote in person early. And so 
you just have to really be careful um, doing these analysis of, of simple correlations. And if one party t happens to be ahead at one point in time, that doesn't mean that they're actually performing better or worse than a previous election. And that's, I really think is the best way to approach these data is to um, do, instead of simple correlations and, and look at margins and, and try and predict that way, you need to do a difference in difference analysis. So look at the differences and pair, com, compare those differences to a previous election and, um, and, you know, and say in party registration or some other metric that you're going to use to forecast what the early vote means. Um, and that will give you a better sense of, of what the direction of the election is going at any one point in time. But you have to be really careful here um, because um, you can get these false signals. And I, I think 2016 in, in North Carolina mm -hmm. was a really good example of this where um, it, the absentee vote, the Democrats were actually doing much better than they had in the 2012 election in, in terms of its mail ballots. Um, and uh, a lot of people uh, started saying, oh, it looks like the Dem you know, Clinton's going to win North Carolina. And I tried to be cautious. I said, yeah, well, it, it looks good for them. But in-person early voting is 90 percent of the early vote in North Carolina. Let's see what happens with that. And sure enough, when we got to the in-person early voting season, um, the numbers just didn't come in very strong for the Democrats. So there had been a shift of behavior where the um, Democrats had were voting mail more often than they had in the past, um, but they didn't vote in the same rates for the in-person early voting, and that was really important. So at the end of the day, once we got to the end of the uh, uh, early voting season, I thought Trump was going to win uh, North Carolina. I, I put that out there, uh, and um, yeah, that was in contrary to some of the polls. And so, um, I, you know, I think there was there's some value here to the early vote because um, it can provide another check, uh, another signal. We know polls have errors to them. That, that's no surprise. And I'm sure the, I know the early vote analysis has errors too, but we should somehow figure out a way that we can harmonize these different signals so that uh, we can, you know, if, if the two, if polls and, and the early vote are telling us the same thing, well, maybe that's, you know, that we have higher confidence in the mm -hmm. polls, but if they're telling us different things, maybe we need to be a little bit more critical about the data and understand what's going on with it. Yeah, great so, point. So knowing this stuff as well as you do, inside out, probably better than anybody, the early voting, all the different ways that states uh, do it in different ways and who shows up and all of that, what is the 30,000-foot view right now, uh, that you, the conclusions you can draw from the early voting so far? Is it simply about enthusiasm or is there more granular or detailed kind of conclusions that you feel safe drawing right now? I feel most confident to say that we're going to have a high turnout election. And we already knew that before the early voting period started. We had had high turnout in the special elections. We had had high turnout in the primary elections. When you look at the polls, people are expressing uh, unusually high interest in voting for a midterm election. All of the signals were pointing to a higher turnout election. And then the early voting started, and we started seeing um, numbers that are just unprecedented, historical, um, with early voting exceeding the presidential election in some uh, places in the country. In uh, other places, even if it's not exceeding the presidential level, it's like 75% of a presidential election in terms of the turnout. This is highly unusual. And I, I know some people are saying, well, this is just people voting earlier than they normally do. And that, you know, this is, there's nothing to be seen here. We're just going to have a normal turnout election. That, that just doesn't strike me as true, given all the other information that we have. All of these signals, and that's you know going back to the magic eight ball. And when you shake it, it says all the signs point to to yes. It's not just the early vote. It's these other things that we know to be true as well. And um, and so if these numbers persist, um, we'll probably have a very special midterm uh, turnout. Uh, and um, in the past uh, three decades or so, we've had a turnout in midterm elections of about forty percent mm -hmm. of those eligible. Uh, You'd have to go back to the 1960s to see turnout rates in the mid or to upper 40 percent range. I think there's a good chance we'll at least meet those levels. Uh, so that would be the 1966 turnout rate of about 48 um, percent. And then if you beat the, that 66 turnout, you'd have to go all the way back to 1944, excuse me, 1914 to get a turnout rate of over 50 percent, which is slightly more than that. So. Um, I mean, we could be seeing something here that we haven't seen in a century. Uh, it's possible. Now, again, we're going to get more data in. 
Um, and I don't disagree with the, the assessment that at least some of these, some of what we're seeing is, is people shifting when they're voting because there's just so much raw emotion out there in the mm-hmm. electorate and people are motivated by that emotion to vote as soon as they possibly can. Um, but I also think we're getting some um, signals that we're just having higher turnout. And if you look really, really deep down into the data uh, and look at, like, say, past vote history and places where we can do that, um, there are certainly signs that uh, this is not just a change of when people are voting. It's also more people are voting. Uh, uh, Michael, um, you said in the beginning how tired you are, and I think we're, we're a community of people who do get to fatigue point at some we yeah, dur- during this election yes. with all the polls we're doing too, yeah, yeah. yeah. we feel and, your pain. Yeah, the um, we couldn't do what we do without all the students who are helping us. Do you have an infrastructure at the University of Florida that is involved with the election project? Right. So over the past uh, two years, we've started creating an election science group at the University of Florida, and we've been uh, moving a number of students through that. Um, I, uh, for the first time this semester, I'm teaching a election data science course that's basically trying to teach people in real time what I'm doing uh, with this early vote data. Um, and so uh, th- that's been happening. Um, I would very, very much like to <laughs> have a, a center, uh, and that's a, you know, a little sore point I have with my administration, um, because I think we would have a lot more visibility if we uh, we're branding ourselves better, um, but you know that's that's here. You know, either neither here nor there. They tell me I've got to get some big grants in, and um, I'm hopeful that uh, uh, I'll have some good news uh, early next year about right. some big things that we're going to be doing here well, at we, the University of Florida. And yeah. yeah well, we ahead. know that if uh, people do want to uh, follow this more intently with you, that they can follow you on Twitter at Elect Project. Um, and you do have a website um, as, as well. But what should what should consumers of these numbers be looking for in the final as we go into the final week uh, before election day? What would you recommend well, to the them? The first thing is, yeah, the yeah the first thing is uh, let's just do a check on the turnout because if if turnout is high and it persists uh, in the early vote through next week. Um, that means that the polls that have the likely voter models, which are um, assuming that there's going to be high turnout, are probably going to be more correct than those that assume that we're going to have like a turnout, say, based on 2014. And there are some pollsters out there who do vote history or, or past uh, um, vote in a you know, sort of demographic profile or, or partisan pro- profile in a past election as their assumption of what they think is going to happen in 2018. I don't think that that's a good assumption at this point. It's possible, you know, I, I can't rule it completely out that we'll see that, but it just seems um, unlikely, highly unlikely at this point. Um, so that's the first thing I would look for. And Tennessee just passed its 2014 number. Uh, later today, we'll probably get some numbers out of Minnesota saying that they've passed 2014, Delaware's passed 2014, um, total early vote, total, not just, you know, and we still got a week and a half, two weeks left in the election. And so um, these numbers are certainly going to continue to pile up and we're going to see states across the country um, greatly exceed their 2014 vote. Um, the other thing is to like do the, the forecasting. And, uh, you know, Nate Silver put down the gauntlet um, and said, you know, show me where I'm wrong. Uh, and I, I said, well, you know, well, let's wait. I, I, I think we'll get a good signal by the end of next week um, as we move along. Um, if we, you know, if, if there's some strong signals that I'm seeing out of some of the states to suggest that uh, um, a, a particular candidate may be favored, um, you know, I'll, I'll be um, opining on that and tweeting on it. But, um, you know, I, I think we're, in most cases, it'd have to be a pretty strong signal. So I think in most cases, what we're going to see is just, the early vote tends to confirm the polls. So um, uh, if I see that the early votes telling us that we're just going to have a close election. You know, th- that's just another sign in uh, you know a place like Nevada, example, or Florida, where we are going to get a lot of early vote data. Um, that you know the polls are correct. Um, if we see something unusual, um, we'll certainly be you know paying attention to that. But um, right now, um, when I look across the data, I don't see anything that would suggest um, that uh, the, the 
the battlegrounds that we think are, are battleground, the close Senate elections, close gubernatorial elections, that they're anything other than close elections right now. And again, we'll get more data, so I'll be able to narrow down that forecast by the end of next week. All right, Mike, Michael McDonald from uh, University of Florida, uh, Project Elect. Thanks so much. This is uh, good for us, too, because we watch you, you watch us, and it's good to get to talk to you. Uh, and that's what we'll be doing these last 10 days. We're going to be watching you on your Twitter feed. And in the show notes for the podcast, if you're uh, listening and you're driving or something and you, you don't have a chance to pull over and write down his Twitter handle, those will be in the show notes and you can grab those uh, there. So thanks for coming on. Appreciate it. And uh, we'll be, like I said, we'll be watching uh, you, you watch us, and We'll uh, gather back after Election Day and compare notes. All right. Well, wonderful talking with you. Well, that will do it for this edition of Poll Hub. Poll Hub is a production of the Marist Poll at Marist College in Poughkeepsie, New York. Mary Griffith, our wonderful executive producer, we thank you. And Kenny Marples. Hope you can put this all together for us, Kenny. <laughs> He's our editor. He we makes us. He tries to make us sound good too. <laughs> Take out all the mistakes, please. We'd also like to thank the Roper Center Archives at Cornell, uh, who provide us with the ability to look back in time and survey questions and results over the decades. Uh, very helpful in trying to figure out just what's going on now. If we can figure out how does this compare with what went on before. Always happy to take your questions, too. Send them to pollhub at maris.edu via email if you want, or you can reach us out uh, reach out to us on social media at Maris Poll on Twitter, Maris Poll on Facebook. And finally, as we say every single week, don't forget to subscribe. Leave, you, you want the final word. Next week. Get? Next week is our shocking, stupendous, off the charts, what's going to happen in the midterms. We're going to be talking to lots of people. Who are going to give their opinion about what to expect. Prognosticators. Prognosticators. So it's the prognostication episode. Yes, and I've been looking forward to this that? for quite... No, <laughs> I can't spell Mississippi as well as you did. But anyways, I-S-S-I-S-S-I-P-P-I-M. There you go. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Without reading it. Yep, but anyway, so we're looking forward to that show and uh, and that podcast, uh, 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 that edition of Poll Hub uh, next week. Uh, that should be a lot of fun. Uh, and then we can all play it back afterwards and see who was right and who was wrong. Mm-hmm.